Welcome back, everyone. Here we are, the final stretch. Two more hours of fantastic presentations awaiting you here in the architecture track. So hope you're all ready to lock in. I'm very excited about the next presentation. We, we have Ryan from Accenture talking about the fact that, hey, you know what? Things are getting a lot faster today. You know, one of the things I've noticed in my career is, is that pace that we are expected to turn solutions around has increased. You know, I like to joke that when I started in IT, 18 months was the average sort of estimate for how long a project is. And just Try saying that to your business partner today. Oh, yeah, you can have that in 18 months. They'll say, sorry, that's not going to work. So I'm very excited to see what Ryan has to say to us today. Note, you can join the conversation. If you click on the Join the Discussion link, that'll take you into the Slack channel. And afterwards, we'll have the Zoom Q&A where we can continue the conversation. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Have at it, sir. Awesome. Thank you for, for that warm introduction. I uh, appreciate everyone joining me here late on a, a Thursday afternoon. Um, and, and excited to talk through how do we make business a first class citizen when, when we look at app modernization, migration, transformation, whatever you may call it. Um, but before we dive into that, a little bit of background about myself. So uh, as mentioned, my name is Ryan Johnson. I'm the Associate Director here at Accenture. Um, over the past three years, we've been building what we call our cloud innovation centers. And those really have been taking, how do we build software differently? How do we look at doing things differently? Accenture's a a huge company, we've been around a real long time, but I think we realized um, with Agile coming along, with Cloud coming along, um, we're seeing a lot of disruption in, in the space. And so really taking sort of a, how do we disrupt ourselves and how do we continue to move forward? So with all that being said, let, let's let's kick off and, and think a little bit about how do, we, how do we kick off this modernization journey? How do we make the business of interested stakeholder in this? Um, and what you'll see here, and this may feel familiar to a, to a lot of the software engineers or architects that have been in the group, and, and really what we did is we, we stole from Agile, right? We, we've taken the same, um, the, the same sort of you know, language that they had as a I want to, so that, and, and we've really made it our own. And, and so we talk about the, this model flow of for a given product, we need the capability to, um, and, and that's really how the business thinks about their their, their piece of the world. Um, and I love when people use the phrase and I get caught saying it all the time and I just did there, the business, right? We've had the IT organization for a long time. We've had the business for a long time. And really what this, this discussion about or this presentation is going to be about is how do we get away from having the business and the IT group? And really how do we get about, go to about becoming partners and, and building features faster? Um, and, and so really we, we created this sort of uh, taxonomy that, that we look here. So for a given product, we need to be able to do something, right? At the end of the day, businesses have to do something. Um, us as IT providers, right? We enable that capability through technology components, most often applications, but it doesn't have to be, right? There's lots of ways we can enable those, those types of capabilities. And then really taking in that from there and saying, okay, understanding that I have the cost, I have the TCOE of those applications, what is my disposition? What do I want to get to? What is my target state I want to get to? And how quickly do I need to get there? Um, and if we look at it and we take a step back and I have an example here, right? So for commercial loans, as a business, I need to be able to, I need the capability to decision products, right? I need to decide whether or not I want to make a commercial loan. In order to do that, there are multiple applications that we can use to do that, right? So maybe I'm using a Moody's analytics, maybe I'm using my mainframe customer data, but that allows me to do that. And then we put a very simple value prop out there. If I replace our mainframe with Encino or some other product, and I make some enhancements here and I change this bit there, right? I, I can easily, you know, say I'm going to reduce the opex by this. I'm going to grow top line revenue. I'm going to create a better customer experience, whatever it may be. And, and you can really define that yourself. But but what this does is it is it creates a simple framework for us, right? It's something that feels familiar to IT professionals that have been around Agile for a while. It's something that business can easily understand. Okay, I can now create a very linear flow from, from my products, through my capabilities, through the technology components. I can see how much those technology components are costing me. And then I'm able to quickly make a business case. And I can really put the business case, as you see here, on a simple page. I can, I can talk to it. I can explain why I want to make these changes. Um, and I can even get to an ROI. Um, so the interesting thing here, sure, it only shows L1 or L0 and L1, right? But, but you can really extend this as far as you want. So you can continue to add in L2s or L3s or L4s or whatever is appropriate for your organization 
to get to that level of granularity where you really have a product that makes sense. And then you can start to map teams and applications to support those. But let, let, let's jump on a little bit. So if we look at the next one, how do we take that insight, right? So I have this great idea. I want to, I want to make these changes, but, but we see people get stuck. And really the problem there is this disposition and priority and value circle. And you can see it, they all feed into each other. Um, in IT, again, we, we've tended for a long time to think about disposition and priority. Am I going to, to replace this software? Am I going to rewrite it, reimagine, change it, whatever it may be? And I need to do it today, tomorrow, next year, next, next century, in some cases for the, the clients I've worked at. But, but the, the business looks at it differently, right? They're looking at priority and value. And, and so they're really saying, hey, I need to change this capability. I need to offer new capabilities so I can grow top line revenue, so I can save costs, whatever it may be, and I need to do it now. And you know, many people will, would probably agree, it almost always needs to be now. So the, the real question is, is, how do you start to blend those two together? And you need to help, help with this framework that allows you to understand, as I change the value, right? whether, whether I'm going to grow top line revenue or take out costs, that can easily change my disposition. And as I change dispositions, that will easily feed into the priority of it. And then again, the priority feeds back into the value. If I do it now, maybe I get more revenue. Maybe I get a bigger cost savings, right? And so it becomes sort of this circle that, that feeds on itself and making sure we align on all three of those and the approach we plan to take is really important. So let, let's jump to the next slide here. And, and when we we'll see this and it's lots of colors. So, so hopefully people aren't, aren't too scared of it. Um, but, but a few things to talk about here. You can see how Accenture's defined ours. We have six listed here. Uh, there's actually seven I've left to retire off because I don't find it very uh, entertaining to talk about, but we have our six R's here that, that we've defined. Um, and then across the top, I listed out what I would say are the five most common goals we see with our clients. Um, so business agility, right? We talked about it. Our release cycles need to be faster, right? We naturally need to get faster. New IT skills. And this is one that, that I think get, gets thrown by the wayside a lot or not necessarily thought about. When, we, when Accenture comes in and we, we get asked a lot, how do we upskill our people? How do we get better at cloud? How do we do cloud native more efficiently? We find that about 70% of the learning that people do, right? How do I build my skills? 70% of that comes from on the job work. Right? So it is not coming from, let me go take a course, let me get certified. Yes, I love certifications. Everyone should have lots of them. But, but the majority of how you learn to do your job is by doing your job. And I know it sounds a bit counterproductive, but that's also why in, in the Cloud Innovation Centers, um, we're big believers of, of pair programming, right? So I, I'll bring in experts that know how to do these types of things. We can easily pair them up with people that, that are a little less skilled. And, and we increase the skill of everyone. Um, next is aligning to the target architecture. So all, all of my engineer friends and architect friends out there know that the target architecture exists. It's constantly changing, but understanding what it is is important. Uh, reducing TCO. This is probably the most common one we see, and you'll see it's the one we most often, or we can easily achieve. Um, and, and that's sort of how do I take out the cost of the data center? And then the last one, leverage cloud capabilities. Again, fairly easy. Um, to, to start to leverage capabilities, whether it be through just plain compute um, or you get, you get into some of the more native services. Um, but, but what's really, really important about this chart, and I think there's two, two things. One, traditionally, as the IT organization, they've typically focused on aligning to the target state architecture, reducing TCO, and leveraging cloud capabilities. And they would pick their disposition based upon those three goals. Right? The business is almost always going to try and drive you towards a refactor and reimagine it. And they, they want the business agility. They want to go faster. They need to release faster. Um, and, and so what, what's important here is that as we pick one of these R's or dispositions, right, we need to make sure we're aligning to these goals, whether it be business agility, new IT skills, reducing TCO, whatever it is. We need to make sure that the degree we want to achieve that is, is in line with the disposition we choose. And then most importantly, and I'll, I'll say it, you know, it is definitely where we see the most, you know, not necessarily confusion, but where we see the most conflict between the two it is in the right hand side, right? The cost and time to achieve that. So we, we've talked with a lot of our clients. They say, I want to be super agile. I want to release every week. I want to release two or three times a week. 
okay, we can do that. But in order to do that, that means as IT, right, we are going to have to refactor or reimagine the process. The system we have today cannot support that. And, and understanding that in order to do that, it's going to cost time and money. Um, and I think aligning those two concepts of the degree we want to achieve these goals, along with sort of the, the cost and time to achieve those goals and having those open and frank conversations early make, makes this sort of conversation or makes this transformation migration modernization much, much easier. The business understands what they're getting out of it. Um, quite, quite often we see, you know, we'll, we'll come in, we'll, we'll start down this journey or, or we've heard these stories from, from our clients where they've gone down this journey and after six months, nine months, whatever it may be, um, but it's almost always a matter of months and less than a year, the, the business has decided I'm not seeing the progress. I'm not, not getting what I want out of this. And, and typically that's because they think they're getting a, a re, reimagine for the cost of a rehost, and, and just aligning those, two, and aligning those two goals and having that conversation it is very important early on. So we talked a little bit about aligning goals and, and those types of things. How do we approach it? Because I, it, it's a bit unique, right? Um, so I, I, again, with the seven R's here, you'll, you'll see I, I, I called it out here. Um, taking an agile mindset again, how do we stay lean? How do we stay sort of in the moment um, and use this just-in-time application disposition framework to, to make sure that we're not spending four or six months, nine months, as, as we've seen in a few places, doing application disposition? What typically happens then, again, it, you know, the business doesn't see progress. They stop the program. We come back two or three years later, we try it again and we do the exact same thing or we see the same thing happen where we spend four, five, six months doing disposition and the business gets no value out of that, right? So we continually have this sort of cycle of disposition. And so what Accenture does here is we approach it as we look to stay, stay lean. We only want to, you know, really look at the technical and business priorities of the top three, four or five applications. And how do we do that, right? We, we lean back on that framework we had. We can help set priorities pretty quickly across the estate, right? We can understand across the, the, the products and capabilities, what are the most important, which one has the biggest ROI that's defined based upon it, its disposition and its value base. Um, and, and so by doing this, right, we don't, we don't spend a lot of time. We aren't wasteful in our disposition. We, we are doing it just enough to keep us moving. So moving on from disposition, we, we then start to look at application planning. Um, and, and I think a lot of people are familiar with these terms, whether it be event storming and, and domain decomposition. But, but really what we do is, is we, we stay short here, right? Again, six to eight months. So now we're talking about you know, maybe nine months and we're ready to start laying down code. Um, and what again, this is a partnership with the business and IT, and we're doing event storming sessions, we're doing interviews, we're defining our bounded context, we're making sure that we have the teams to support those products and capabilities that the business is looking to build. The other thing we do is we, we have a very clear set of uh, cloud native architecture guidelines. Uh, the, the goal there is to make sure that we're aligning to target state, right? We, we, we talked about it earlier, we wanna make sure we have that target state, we wanna make sure we're leveraging the cloud capabilities for, for what its purpose is. Um, and then really, how do we execute it? And I know this is a bit of a busy slide, so I'll, I'll hopefully I'll talk everyone through it. So first and foremost, and I think it's super important here and it's been relevant, I've heard it tons and tons of times today, platform services, and in this case, right, the, the Tomzoo platform, right? It, it is critical that that be in place before we get going. We, we have tried doing it in parallel and, and we struggle. We need a place to land the code when we bring in are very talented engineers and, and they begin to write code. I don't have time and I, I really don't want to spend the time necessarily, you know, six or four or six or eight or nine months setting up a, a cloud landing zone, setting up a platform, right? It, it's much easier, right? If we have the Tanzu platform in place, then our engineers can quickly come in. We begin to build uh, microservices on top of Spring Boot and we're off and running very quickly. So. A huge, a huge boost there, right? We can go much faster. We can deliver much faster. The, then the next piece, and, and this is the hard work, and it's it's why it's the the uphill part of the mountain is what we call our Pathfinder teams. They, they start to kick off this art of the possible. They start to figure out how do we get to production. 
Uh, they do what, what do we call our first descent, which is where we take a very risky proposition, right? How are we getting to fraud? I don't know how I want to do this serverless architecture. I don't know how I'm going to connect to this. And we really challenge this team and say, this is going to be hard and it's going to be difficult for the next six to eight weeks. But what they're doing is, is they're climbing up that mountain. They're showing everyone else the way they're setting the route for the rest of the team. Once, once we get through that, right, we start to get into this broader app transformation and scaling delivery model. You know, 10 to 16 week increments is what we, we work on here. And you can see the loops here. And, and really, this is where we start to bring in the broader team, right? We start to go wide so we can go fast. A, a lot of businesses cannot wait, right? We can't have a, a team of eight engineers working on modernization forever. So this is where we start to get pretty wide. We've, we've used that Pathfinder team. We know what to do. We understand the challenges and how to work around them. And we start to bring on two or three or four of these app transformation teams. Um, and, and leveraging those patterns, leveraging XP, whether it be pair programming, TDD, all of those types of things, we, we can move very quickly. And then the last piece here, and, and not to be discounted because we have been talking a lot about how do we do this efficiently and how do we do this uh, you know, in a cost conscious way, is we start to look at scale app delivery. So as we get into this, we, we start to say, how, how can we leverage our low cost delivery centers, right? Whether they be uh, in the European Union, in South America, or, or in Asia, and how do we start to look at, at bringing those people to bear? understanding that, that there's a lot of work to be done. Um, it, it's not going away, so don't be afraid to pull in friends and family, whoever you can get to help with this work. Um, the, the more people we have on this, the faster we can go, and, and that's good for everyone. We can realize business cases, we can, we can really deliver on it. So based upon that, uh, a, a quick example we have here. So um, working out at, at a, a financial services company, a few things we did, and we, and we put this all together, which I think has been fantastic. Um, so you can see here, we created working software, right? We were able to have that Pathfinder team out there. And in 16 weeks, or in six weeks, we were able to deliver what the client had estimated would take them 16 weeks to do. So that team, again, very focused, very, very much about getting to production. That's, that's kind of their main mission. Second thing we had was, a, was our app transformation road mapping team, or that app, app roadmap team out there figuring out how do we build an ongoing funnel that we can reuse, identifying where are the key problems with technical debt? How do we put that into a, a roadmap that really helps us get there, right? They help get up the first descent there and, and then we start to get you know, wide and use multiple teams and we start to move through them very quickly. And then the last piece, and, and you know, I'm not saying it, it's the wrong way to do it. I, you know, I think it's very valid and it has its use cases is a big data center migration. So, we, we talked about how do we move 200 plus applications in seven months. Now, the, the key here is, right, these are very much a refocus. We were, you know, us, or us being Accenture and the client, we're very clear on, on the understanding here was simply to move these out of a, a colo data center, move them into the cloud and start to realize some of those TCO savings and start to allow me to capture, you know, a little bit of the target state architecture, a little bit of, of the cloud capabilities that I was there, right? We started to, to get people clean IT skills because we're now running in the cloud. We need to know how to manage and, and, and I deal with applications there. But we were very clear up front, you are not going to be able to release faster, right? Your CI CD cycles will still be the same as if they were on-prem uh, and, and, and all those sorts of things. So it's been super successful here. We, we, we love working with the client. It's been a fantastic journey with them, but a lot of it was sort of up up front identifying what are the goals, what are the objectives by application, and then making sure we have the, the right sort of skills and the right team there. Um, and just a few minutes left, I couldn't, I couldn't you know, go through this without talking about COVID-19 since we're all, all remote here. So we used to do this all in person. We used to work really tightly with our clients, right? We would go there, we would travel there all the time. But so what did we do, right? How did we change and how did we adapt to it? Um, you know, we used to, we were a modern workforce. We still are a modern workforce focused on it, employee health and well-being. Um, and then really talking about how do we build high quality code and, and what, what happened, right? We, we changed and, and that's okay. But what did we change into? We changed into a mo modern remote workforce. No problem, right? We're all here. We're all having a great time. I think most people can handle it. And, and the other thing is, you know, we're location agnostic. I think it's been powerful for us. We are no longer limited by 
what city people live in, what time zone they're in, right? We're able to span across those and overcome those challenges. Um, and probably the most important thing, we still pair on everything. So I, I know I mentioned it a few times. So we, we found pairing to be very effective when people are remote. It's been fantastic, right? Part of pairing, what has helped with pairing is, is it's starting to counter the feeling of isolation that we've had. Um, so we've seen very similar productivity when we were in person versus when we're pairing. You know, the, the other thing that helps people do is it helps them communicate. They, I think there's more tools out there now, right? We now have a better sense of, of how to connect remotely and, and it's allowing us to have this support structure. So I think the important thing here is, you know, our methodology hasn't changed. That methodology was built when we were in person with people. And what we found in, in, in being remote is that really our methodology hasn't changed, right? We continue to do the same activities all day and every day. What we found is our, actually our methodology has been reinforced. We found it to be more important than ever. And sure, we, we've changed our tools. We've changed how we connect to our clients. We've changed our tactics. But at the end of the day, the methodology has really stayed the same. And I think that's, that's an awesome sign to see. And I'm super excited to uh, answer some Q&A here in the, the next Zoom when we all wander over there. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ryan. I really appreciate that. Well, friends, here we are. We're almost done. We've got a couple more presentations. So I encourage you to stretch your legs, hit the restroom, top up your beverage of choice. And we will be back with a very good friend of mine, Rohit and Madhav, right after that, talking about APIs and events. I'm very excited about this. Rohit has been sitting in the virtual backstage with me for the last two days. So I'm very excited to actually see him now to be on the other side of the podium, so to speak. All right, so let's take a break and we will be back here shortly. Cheers. <laughs>